Today is another patron powered video. This is a video where my patrons ask me questions and I answer them in a video. So sit down, grab a cup of coffee and let's talk about audio stuff. This first question comes from Terry Hall. Do I still need a pair of subwoofers if I'm considering tower speakers? perhaps the Q40? Well, the answer to that question is, it all depends. It depends on how far down your speakers go, what the response of those speakers look like, what you like from a bass perspective, and the dreaded room. So depending upon where you put those speakers, you could have issues with your room where you have either a huge rise in bass or a huge trough in bass. There's nothing you can really do about that. Short of throwing thousands of dollars at room treatment that may or may not work or running some DSP. So the short answer is, I don't know. Personally for me, unless a speaker goes all the way down to 20 Hertz, having a subwoofer, maybe not two, but having a subwoofer always kind of helps to fill in anything that's missing. And usually you're still gonna have things that are missing. But we also have to go back to, does it really matter what the measurements look like? We can measure our room, we can do DSP, DRAC, things like that. But at the end of the day, if you're interested in a tower speaker, I would suggest you buy it, you sit down and you listen to it, and just ask yourself, do I feel like I need more bass? Because if you don't, then don't get a subwoofer. I think oftentimes we feel like we need to have certain things or a certain response in our room, but what we really need is just to listen and do what sounds best for you and makes you enjoy the music. Who cares if your room has issues? If it sounds good to you and you're enjoying the music and it makes you happy on the inside, then leave it as it is. But from my perspective, a lot of the speakers or the floor standing speakers that I review still could use a little help on the bottom end. I don't necessarily know if you need two subs, but one sub generally isn't a bad idea. And you'll be able to move that sub around where normally you can't really move the speakers around too much. So it all depends. If you're interested in a speaker though, I would buy them and listen to them with no subs and then maybe add one sub in and see if it fills things in. Add two subs in if you have to. Like don't run out and buy a whole bunch of subs because you anticipate you're gonna have problems. If you have a sub, Turn on the speakers, turn on the sub, move the sub around. If you like it, leave it alone. If it's too much bass, just stick with your speakers. Mark asks, how many hours a week do you work a week between the channels, editing, shooting video, and coming up with content ideas? And reaching out to manufacturers, it seems like a lot to juggle. It can be, but I mean, here's the good thing. I don't usually reach out to a whole bunch of manufacturers. I'm not soliciting a bunch of products to review. Usually they reach out to me. Now, occasionally like the source point eights, I reached out to MoFi. I've reached out to SVS in the past. I've reached out to Emotiva in the past, but I don't spend a ton of time reaching out to different manufacturers. I work every day. Now, normally I film and I edit between 7.30, 8 o'clock in the morning till about 11, 11.30. After a bit of a break, usually I come back and I start to listen to things. I also have things going on all the time in every room of my house as far as speakers or different pieces of equipment. But the other thing is, like even when I'm working, even when I'm listening, I'm still enjoying myself. So I'm watching movies with the kids or I'm listening to music. At night, I'll answer emails or take screenshots or do things. So in any given day, I mean, I'm probably working a solid eight to 10 hours a day, but most of that is stuff that I would be doing anyway. And I'm also a bit compulsive and obsessive. So I think I just have the type of personality that goes with, I don't know, being decent at YouTube. Having two channels now is a bit of a challenge at times, but I have a watch channel where I review watches and I can wear a watch all day and not really have to do much about it. And after three or four days of wearing a watch, I have a pretty good idea of how I feel about it. So again, it's kind of just adding things into my workflow that I would be doing anyway. I work more now than I ever have in my life. The difference is most of the work that I do now is completely enjoyable and it's way better than working for corporate America. Tom has a really good question. How can one tell what the next upgrade should be? How do you identify the weakest link in your system so you can upgrade effectively and efficiently? You don't. 
that's the thing, right? If you have a system and you're listening to it and you enjoy it, then you have no idea what you should change or if you should change anything at all. If I'm being 100% pragmatic, you shouldn't change anything. But I also understand that many of us are gearheads and we just like buying stuff. So in that instance, I would take a look at your system and seek out different reviews, whether they be written or YouTube about that component and then seek out different reviews of components that you may be interested in. So if you have a DAC, for example, and you're thinking about getting another DAC, go watch and read reviews about that other DAC. And if you're going to change things, only change things one at a time. And hopefully you can keep the product that you're changing out. So then at that point, you get to be the reviewer. You get to AB the products, whether it's a phono cartridge, speakers, or amplifiers, you get to A, B it, but don't go changing out a whole bunch of stuff at once because then you really have no idea what the weakest link is. And really, it may not be the weakest link. It may just be your preference. You may just prefer a different amp over the one that you have. I think we always talk about better and best, but what we really should be talking about is better or best for us. And that's all personal preference. Speaking of personal preference, Mark Shank asks, what is your personal preference for stereo music amplifier power? I don't know if you mean like how much power or which brand I like. Usually for me, anything above 50 watts is generally what I like to stick to, but those watts can all be different, like class D 50 watts versus class AB 50 watts. Then you have different amplifiers like the A11 Mark II from Rotel. I thought that thing was a powerhouse and it was only rated at 50 watts. I personally like to have as much power as I possibly can, good power, and my reference amplifiers right now are probably the Emotiva DR1 monoblocks. It's the best amplifier I've ever heard. It's also like 3,500 bucks or 3,200 bucks for a pair of them, so it's not cheap. The A11 Mark II is really an awesome amp. The V3 from Fozzy Audio is also a very good amp. Little thin on the bottom, but super clean, super clear, super low noise floor. The topping, what is it, LA, 90 discreet used to be one of my favorite amplifiers but there's some noise coming out of it now so i can't really recommend it anymore but sonically i like clean and i like punch so i want it to be super clean you know big sound i mean that's kind of funny right i want it to be punchy i want it to be super clean i want it to be super natural with the huge sound well of course we do right of course we want that and for budget amplifiers i like uh, the t9 pro from iema too for like a little budget integrated amplifier but the more power the better usually jeremiah wells please explain common audiophile terms like forward bright, scooped out mids, etc. It really helps me when you point to a specific song part so I can reference that. I got the gear, now I need the ear. For me, bright means overemphasized in the treble area, but really bright for me means overemphasized in the upper treble. So like 2K up to around 4K, kind of where the sibilance area is. Some people, that's probably 6K too. Forward also means overemphasized in the mid-range area. It could be upper mid-range too. And I think forward and bright usually go hand in hand. So for instance, if you're listening to MTV Unplugged, Kurt Cobain, dumb. You listen to one set of speakers and you kind of get an idea of where Kurt Cobain is. Then you put on something that's forward. Kurt Cobain is gonna seem like he is more forward. And that's what forward really means. I think most of the time people are referencing mid-range vocals. Scooped out mids would be the exact opposite. So you're gonna have Kurt Cobain stepped back, you're gonna have less clarity, or acoustic guitars are gonna feel less prominent. I also use the word thin. What that means to me is the bass isn't as punchy or as palpable or as thick. Also use words like organic. To me, organic means it sounds like the actual instrument would sound if it was in your room. Sometimes things don't necessarily sound bad, but they don't necessarily sound natural either. Sometimes our preference is for things that don't sound natural, maybe have an overemphasis in the clarity region. So I hope that helps. Brian Romska, I think I'm subscriber 560-ish. Wow. By the way, we're getting close to 200,000 subscribers. If you want some free stuff, 
Fill out the Google form. I'll try to link it here. It'll also be linked in the description and the pinned comment. Only thing you have to do is subscribe, follow me on Instagram, and fill out the Google form. If you're already subscribed, it's okay. Just fill out the Google form. And if you're not on Instagram, that's okay too. It's been so cool to see you start doing YouTube full time and watching you grow into a such a professional. Well, thank you. Uh, but I do miss some of your old unhinged comic stupidity between two speakers, the wobbly table pouring oil into a crap speaker, etc. That was actually chocolate syrup. Any chance you could do, be extra ridiculous for a couple of bits? Yeah, for sure. For sure. I need to bring that back. I was actually talking to another creator this morning and he mentioned something I did uh, at the beginning of the channel. And I, I just realized I used to be way funnier back then. Um, I still have fun now. I have a lot of fun making videos. But back then I used to do some really silly stuff. So yeah, yeah, that's going to come back. Steve Gray, great question here. How much sonic difference do you hear between streamers? And what kinds of differences? I mean the streamer function only while using a separate deck. That's really tough. I haven't really delved deep into that rabbit hole yet. A lot of people will say, this is the best streamer I've heard. And I don't think I have the equipment. I mean, I do have the equipment. I don't think I have the patience to really make that comparison. Because if I'm using the same DAC, for me, I would have to have two of the same DACs. And then I'd have to have those both going into the same amplifier, into the same speakers, so that I could easily switch back and forth to tell if I did hear any big differences. Don't get me wrong, I think there can be sonic improvements from streamer to streamer. I think they're probably slim. So I think it depends on where you're at on your journey as an audiophile or as a music enthusiast, whether or not you even want to worry about that. To me, a streamer should be easy to use. If you already have a favorite DAC and you're digitaling out of the streamer into that DAC, chances are there's not going to be a huge difference in streamers, even if you're going from a very affordable one all the way up the chain to a very expensive one. Think Weem Pro, which is 150 bucks versus, I don't know, $2,000 streamer. I could be completely wrong though too, but unless you have super analytical, super clean speakers, a super analytical amp and all that stuff, I don't even know if you're gonna be able to hear a huge difference. But again, is it worth even exploring? Because if you're enjoying the music, you have a DAC that you love, I think the differences in streaming quality is going to be pretty slim. I think some manufacturers would like you to believe that it would be a huge, eye-opening, angel singing from heaven experience. I think practically, it's probably not. But for somebody like you, Steve, who is pretty far down their audiophile journey, I can see that being a logical next step in your journey. For someone that's just starting out, I don't think they should worry about it. For someone that's got some time and the inclination, yeah, go check it out. Actually, I'd love to hear your thoughts. I would love to put it in the comments, you and anybody else watching, if they have heard a dramatic improvement in Sonics from a different streamer. But it's got to be on the same DAC, it's got to be through the same amplifier, and it's got to be through the same speakers. So thank you so much for watching. If you've made it this far, please subscribe to the channel. Give this video a like. You can check out the links in the description. Most of those are, are affiliate links. Also check out maybe one of these other videos. So don't binge watch anything on Netflix or Hulu. Binge listen and fill yourself with happiness. And with that, I'm Randy. I'm the Cheap Audio Man.